Good evening. It's nice to see you all on Thursday night. About a year ago, a group of young professionals got together under the guidance of the SCA to inspire and unite the community with a pro-Israel message through events and education. Since the group's founding, the Sephardic Israeli Committee has brought a Yom Ha'atzmaut Israeli art battle, which attracted over 300 of our community college kids and young adults. We provided an Israeli crash course, a, a, um, an Israeli advocacy 101 crash course, with world-renowned Israeli advocate Neil Lazarus. And we brought an art show featuring a delegation of artists directly from Israel to counter the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement. And tonight, we are very proud and privileged to present former ambassador and Knesset member Michael Oren. to address our community and open the floor to a Q&A. It's a very unique opportunity. We're very grateful that Michael and Sally were able to join us tonight. So thank you again. Thank you for making the effort. We know it's not easy. And I just want to talk about a personal experience. I read, I know you don't want me to call you ambassador. It's very hard for me to call you Michael, I'm sorry. I read the ambassador's book this past July, and it really, it opened my eyes to a lot of different points and concepts, and I, um, I was really inspired by what I read, and it really made me feel, watching you as an American kid make Aliyah, become the ambassador, become a member of Knesset, or really, anything is possible. And uh, it was very inspiring to me, and one of the points in the book that I found to be extremely, um, that resonated a lot with me, was when you shook Yitzhak Rabin's hand when you were younger, and you said that was a pivotal moment in your life. And um, I just want to say, this morning I had the privilege of driving with you for an hour, one-on-one, -on -one, and we got to talk about all different points about politics and family, and it was really, that was a pivotal moment for me. And I don't think that I'm truly grasping how pivotal that was, because we're still fresh, you're jet-lagged, I'm 4 a.m. wake up, but, I'm sure over the coming weeks, um, that, that will really start to resonate even more. So we're really excited to have you. We have a beautiful night ahead. Um, I'll give you just a quick overview of what's going to happen, just so you kind of have an idea. So we're going we're gonna to do a hatikva. We're going to do a brief Divre Torah from Rabbi Aikitao. We're going to have the president of the shul, Eli Greenberg, introduce Michael. We're going to have Michael speak for about uh, a half an hour. And then we're going to have Murray Mizrahi moderate a Q&A session for about 45 minutes. It's an open Q&A, and when I was talking to Sally, Sally was saying, be hard, be difficult, ask tough questions, because that's where Michael shines. So please, we invite the toughest questions you got. Before we do proceed, I just, uh, there are some thank yous in order that we really, um, we really owe to some people who put a lot of effort at this event. So I'd just like to take a moment to express our gratitude. I want to thank Jaime Shama, Murray Mizrahi, and the entire SCA board. I would like to thank Eli Greenberg, Rabbi Aikital, and the whole Kol Israel family for hosting us here tonight. I would like to, uh, to thank our prestigious rabbis and, and um, synagogue presidents for making such an effort to promote the event and, and for joining us this evening, so thank you very much for that. A special thank you to Joe Dweck for coordinating the fabulous security you saw outside. I've never seen that before, so that's pretty cool. And I would like to thank the, com the committee members of the Sephardic Israel Committee. If anybody is not involved and was interested in getting involved in the committee, please come see me afterwards. But I'd like to take a moment just to thank everybody involved. Uh, this is in alphabetical order, so everyone really did uh, pull their weight. No specific order, but we'd like to thank Gloria Safdie. We'd like to thank Harry Greenberg, Jojo Tower, Michael Dweck, Michelle Catton, Morris Michael, Murray Mallow, Nina Bilderici, Rena Nasser, Sarah Torgeman, and Victor Dweck. 
Would like to also thank the volunteers who helped us this evening with checking people in and handing out the index cards. David Didia, James Tabelli, Joey Aini, Kara Misri, Rachel Halu, and Tala Bakpul. And I'd like to give a special thanks, she's not with us here tonight, but to Jennifer Sutton, who coordinated this whole event and really made the dots connect. So uh, Danny, you can give her my regards, please. <laughs> and last but not least, Michael and Sally, thank you for making the effort. It's really, it's an honor, and we're very excited for the evening. So to kick things off, I'd like to invite um, Eli Sion. Where are you, Eli? No? Aha, welcome. We'd like to, uh, to have a class, so everyone please rise. Colon Vale Caused us 
to lose that dream. And seeing how Moshe Rabbeinu, our holy prophet, reacted to these two events, really, I think, frames what our mission is in 2016. The two events are Chet Egel, the sin of the golden calf, and Chet HaMeragelim, the sin of the spies. And when we look at them, both terrible events, and yet Moshe Rabbeinu has to stand before God and plead on behalf of the nation and say, Hashem, do not destroy them. Don't let the dream die. And how does Moshe do that? He's sitting with stone tablets there, dancing around the golden calf. What does he do? So he pulls out his ace in the hole. And he tells Hashem, he says, listen, we have a deal. We have a covenant. We have Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. What are you going to say to them? We're their progeny. You can't just rip up that deal. And what does Hashem do? He forgives them. We're back. And now we fast forward just a short time later. And there it is again. The dream ready to slip through our grasps. And the spies come. And now Moshe is thinking, what do I do? Hashem wants to destroy us again. Now if you were Moshe, which card would you pull? The one that worked. Mention Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. He doesn't do that. He appeals to Hashem's mercy. He says, Lama yomeru mitzrayim. What are they going to say? Your name is going to become diminished. Wait a second, Moshe. You have the answer. The answer is in the covenant. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. You're going to become slaves. You're going to get the Torah. You're going to go to Israel. That's the deal. It worked. You're leaving a perfectly good excuse on the shelf? And as Hazal tell us, it's really such an impactful message, is that there was a reason why Moshe deviated. Moshe understood that when it came to the sin of the spies, when it came to people speaking badly about Eretz Israel, about the land, when it came to people not having faith, Emunah, that God would take care of them in that new land despite their enemies. And when the people could not find a way to say, you know what, we can do this to band together, Moshe knew, he said, you know what, all those things are part of the covenant. So you broke the deal yourself. You can't put that deal back on the table when your sin was about that very deal, spitting in the deal's face. So Moshe knew, I can't say that. That's not going to work here in Chet HaMeragelim. Rabotai, we stand in very challenging times. Not just in Eretz Israel, in Medinat Israel, but with Jews all across the globe. And it's very easy to lose that faith, lose that emunah, and lose that fire inside to say, you know what? This land is ours. And no matter what happens, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will be with us. He'll guide us. And he'll make us strong. We lost that momentarily in the desert. And many of us, sometimes when you open a newspaper, click on your favorite blog, or listen to the radio, we feel sometimes that faith becoming a little weakened in our hands. Maybe I should cancel my trip to Israel. Maybe, you know, 
some of those other naysayers, they're right. Maybe they have a point. It's very scary to be in a world with such people, Yemach Shemam, as ISIS. And their own one purpose is to get us to give up. And if we stand up and we say, we'll never give up, and we'll always have that emunah, and always know to band together our dream of not just a few weeks of winning a jackpot lottery, not just a few months, but of thousands of years, that dream will not only stay alive, but it'll come to fruition. Everyone in this room is making a conscious effort to say, you know what, Thursday night, wife night, date night, I'm sorry, honey, this is just as good. <laughs> but you know what? It's time to strengthen ourselves, to find out more information. If we have a fear, how do we tackle it? And not just from someone on the street, but somebody who's not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. It's really an amazing honor to have everybody here tonight. Bezrat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will constantly guide our hand, guide our thoughts, and next year we'll all be together in Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh, Amen. Amen. Thank you for the inspirational words, Rabbi. I'd like to invite Call Israel's president, Eli Greenberg, to the stage. Hi, welcome everybody. It's, it's really an honor uh, to, to host this SCA event and for such a prestigious guest as, uh, as Michael Oren. So thank you so much for coming and everybody for coming. And I hope next time, God willing, you can come again and give us more inspirational words. And next time, you won't have to have your dinner in our temporary trailer, but in our new building next door, which, you know, God willing, will be in a couple of years. So, uh, <laughs> I have the easiest job tonight to, to introduce uh, Michael Oren. Uh, I, I could stay up here myself for 30 minutes, but I'm afraid of what might be thrown at me. So I'm going to keep it really short and just give a, a brief overview. It, it, if you summarize everything that Michael has done over his lifetime, I, I think if he summarizes that he has been fighting his entire life for Israel and for world Jewry. And in preparation of that, he, had, he got two degrees, an undergraduate degree and a master's degree from Columbia, and then another master's degree and a PhD from Princeton. He grew up in New Jersey, close by in West Orange, and he made Aliyah to Israel when he was 24. He fought for us, for, you know, for us, for Israel and for us Jews. He fought on the battlefield, in academia, in world opinion, in diplomacy, and politically. In the battlefield, he was a paratrooper in 1982 in Lebanon. His unit took a lot of fire, a lot of casualties. He was in the middle of it. After that war, he volunteered to go to the Ukraine undercover to help the, uh, the Jewish Zionists in, in Ukraine. In 2005, he was called up again uh, for the Gaza disengagement and was in the thick of that too. On the academic and uh, public opinion front, he was a visiting professor in Yale and Harvard. He spoke to many, many universities. He got NRA degrees, he gave commencement speeches, all in an atmosphere of, of uh, anti-Semitism and, and negative words against Israel. And he was out there bringing the message that, that we should be giving out to the entire world. He also wrote three books of nonfiction, and I guess he has his spare time, two books of fiction. His uh, highly regarded book on the Six Day War was a, a New York Times bestseller and is considered by historians as one of the most authoritative books on that war. His latest book, Ally, My Journey, My Journey Across the American-Israel Divide, is an impassioned critique of the Obama administration uh, 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 handling of Israel and working with Israel 
and uh, it, it's a contentious, if you, if you look online and you, you see the reviews, uh, you can see that Michael really hit a nerve. He, he put the truth out there and there's a lot of reaction and there's still debate today. So uh, an amazing book and uh, you know, we hope to hear a, a little more about it. Our, com our community is very involved in Israel. You know, we send some of our own, our own children, we send to fight for Israel, we're involved in business, we're very politically active on behalf of Israel, and our hope is that we can get some insight today and, uh, as the rabbi mentioned, some more courage and more inspiration to continue that fight and, and be doing the right thing. So, Michael, without further ado. sure I get fed with chai tea, which keeps me going. Joe Dueck, uh, thanks for, the, for the, the security. There's probably more people in uniform out there than there are people in here tonight, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. And Rabbi Tal, thank you for the Dvar Torah. And uh, a special thank you for my parents coming all the way from my hometown of West Orange, New Jersey. My fathers, we're all here to celebrate my father's 91st birthday. <laughs> And my, my adored sister, Karen, who's up, father, like, her real claim to fame is that she's the mother of John Rudnitsky, who's the new star of Saturday Night Live. Oh. And, and I think the only Jewish member of the cast, Karen? No. There's one. Who let him on? <laughs> Why well, Saturday Night Live? John Rudnitsky. Uh, so, so, ally. All right, we'll talk a little bit about Ally tonight, this controversial book. Oh my God. Um, this book is 400 pages long. It took me 11 months to write. It was supposed to take me 12 months to write, but I had to take off 50 days for Operation Protective Edge to appear on CNN and other uh, international media outlets, and the Israeli media as well. So 11 months to write, and you finish a 400 page book in 11 months, and what are you left with? What is the name of the book? What are you going to call it? And I had no idea. And one day, uh, I woke up and I, I turned to my wife, Sally, who's here. And, Sally, hi. And, she'll, she'll go this and um, she, I said, it's two syllables with one word. And I thought about it, I thought about it, and I said, ah, the name of the book is Ally. And she says to me, somebody's going to say that the name of the book is Ally. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you what major Jewish federation I was introduced as the author of the book, Ali. Okay? And then she said, Sal then Sally said, well, someone's going to say that you left off the S. Right? Some of you got that. Ali, Ali, Ally, this has to be one of the most beautiful words in the English language. Think about it. Um, ally almost always has a positive connotation. You can be a partner in crime, but not an ally in crime. Think about it. It, it evokes a sort of warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, and certainly in Hebrew, the, tr the translation for ally is ben brit, or the feminine bat brit. Ben brit, a very beautiful term in Hebrew, and it evokes not only the relationship between human beings, but it evokes the very special relationship between the Jewish people and God. Habrit, the covenant. Israel and the United States have a very special relationship. It is unequaled by 
any bilateral relationship which the United States has had with any other country in its post-World War II period. And the reasons are this. First of all, a spiritual connection. If you ask me what is the basis of this U.S.-Israel alliance, it's spiritual. And it begins centuries before Israel's creation in 1948. It begins in the early 17th century when the first Puritan pilgrims come to New England from England. <coughs> and in England, they were persecuted by the church. And they looked for a model to overcome their persecution, their suffering. And they looked at the New Testament. They didn't found it. So they looked back into what they called the Old Testament. And there they found something rather unique. They found a God who spoke to his people in their own language. And Rabotai, God only speaks one language. Only speaks Hebrew. Do you know this? And let me live with a Brooklyn accent. All right, but he speaks Hebrew. And, uh, and God made a promise to his people. He said he was going to rescue them from exile, to restore them to their promised land, and he kept his promise. So the Puritans read the story. They became the new, Is new Israel. England became the new Egypt. The Atlantic Ocean became the new Sinai. And they came to the coast of New England, which became the new promised land, which is why if you go to the Northeast, you're going to have about, about a, a thousand place names that are Hebrew place names. You have your... Your, your Jerichos and your Bethlehems and your Bethany's if you're out in Long Island, your Beth Page. You know what Beth Page is? Bet Puggy. Bet, Pe, Beth, Bethany is Bet Honey. And uh, I just read the other day that, this, that Woodstock Festival was not held in Woodstock but in Bethel. Bet El. Right? Those are your Woodstock fans. And they gave Hebrew names to their kids, the Jacobs and the Benjamins and the Rebecca's and the Sarah's. They made Hebrew acquired language at all their universities. James Madison, James Madison, the fourth president, was a Hebrew major at Princeton, and he failed. <laughs> I can identify with that. So deeply internalized was the, the biblical Hebrew narrative among the founding fathers and mothers of this country that the conclusion of the American Revolution in 1783 there was a big debate of what, what was going to be the, the national, the great seal of the United States. And there was a group of American leaders who said, oh, we should have the American bald eagle. But another group of American leaders said, no, the symbol of the United States of America should show Moses leading the children of Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of Israel. And this country came this close to having Moshe Rabbeinu as its national symbol. That's what the president up there would like, Moshe Rabbeinu, right there. Uh, we, you got, the, you got the, uh, the follically challenged bird instead. Um, but you should know that, that the, the, the symbol of Moshe Rabbeinu was designed by Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. So it wasn't a peripheral notion. Now for many of these members of the founding father and mother generation, the fact that they were the new Jews meant that they had a strong spiritual connection with the old Jews, us. They were mishpochah. They didn't necessarily want us living in their neighborhoods, but, you know, we were Mishpocha. And they had a close, the fact that they, were, they had inherited a new promised land, that they had a close connection to the old promised land, the land of Israel. And they concluded that to be good Christians, to be good Americans, it was their divinely ordained Jew duty to help those old Jews get home and recreate their Jewish state. And this wasn't a peripheral motion. That John Adams was the second president. said it was his greatest dream that 100,000 Jewish soldiers would march back into Judea, as he called it, and reclaim a Jewish kingdom. You had uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1863 <coughs> say that it was his dream that once he had restored the Union after the Civil War, he would help restore the Jews to their promised land. Um, you, had, uh, um, the, you had president after president reaching very, very similar to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was the son and grandson of Presbyterian ministers. When the British came to him in 1917 and said, would you support a, 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 a declaration giving Palestine, it was then called, to the Jewish people after the British army had liberated it from the Turks, because there were many people in Britain were afraid that if they issued this thing, the Arabs would cut off oil to the British Empire. And Woodrow Wilson said, definitely, do it, do it. And his own advisors told him not to do it, and he did it. He did it because... He believed that he had a divinely ordained duty to help restore the Jews to their holy land, as he said. And the British took this declaration home. They issued it as the Balfour Declaration in 1917. That became the basis, basis of the British mandate in Palestine, which became, in 1947, the basis of the partition resolution of the UN that created a Jewish state. 
Now the big question is whether the United States would ever recognize this Jewish state. And in a case which I know has no parallel in the annals of American foreign policy, every single senior advisor in the administration said, don't do it. Arabs will cut off oil, Western Europe will fall to the Soviets, the Jews of Palestine don't know how to fight, the US Army's gonna have to go and bail them out. And the President of the United States locked himself into the White House for two days, from May 12th to May 14th, 1948, but at 6, 11 p.m., May 14th, 1948, the United States became the first state on earth to recognize the recreated Jewish state, the state of Israel. And the president, as you know, was Harry Truman. And why did Truman do it? Why did Truman ignore the advice of all of his senior counselors? Because Truman was a strict Baptist, and he claimed to have memorized the Bible by age 14. And when asked why he made this difficult decision, he had a very simple answer. He said, I'm, I'm Cyrus, he said, I'm Cyrus know your Bible. It's Kolish. Kolish, the ancient Persian king, who restored the Jews from exile and enabled them to reestablish their ancient kingdom. I'm Cyrus. The United States remains today the most religiously observant industrialized state in the world. More people go to a church in this country than any other country. Go to Europe. They're selling off their churches. Holland is selling off 700 churches if you want a church. <laughs> I mean, they're empty. Not this country. People read their Bible. And when I it was in Washington, I would go into the Congress. The first time this happened, I, was, I didn't know how to react, but you'd go into the office of some congressman from West Texas whose district was five times the size of the state of Israel. Maybe he had two Jewish constituents, maybe. But he had a Bible opened up on his desk to, the, to Genesis, where it says in Genesis, God says, those who bless my people shall be blessed. And this congressman points to this thing and says, you see that? You see that? That's God's world. I believe in that. How much aid do you need for Iron Dome? <laughs> Just like that. It happened a lot. The spiritual connection. But Israel comes into being in May 1948 not just as a Jewish state, it comes into being as a democratic state. And the list of democracies in the world is getting shorter and shorter, but we are the, on the ultimate short list. We are one of those few countries in the world, along with the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, one of the few countries in the world that has never known a second of non-democratic governance. Think about that. And we're the only country on that list that has not known a second of peace. And wars crush democracies all the time. We withstood it all. And the fact that we have representative government, we have the rule of law, the fact that we do have civil rights, is a source of tremendous connectedness between Israel and the United States. The fact that in Israel alone among the states in the Middle East, there is a memorial to Martin Luther King. In Israel alone, there's a memorial to 9-11. There's a memorial to John Fitzgerald Kennedy. There is not one but two replicas of the Liberty Bell in the state of Israel inscribed with the book. With the words from the book of Levitic Leviticus, let freedom ring throughout the land, put there by the founding fathers. That is the connection of democracy. What you didn't have was a strategic alliance. And those people who say that Israel and the United States were allied strategically starting in 1948 don't know their history very well because there was a war in 1967, Six Day War. <coughs> I could recommend a certain book. <laughs> I can't because I'm in Knesset. But it is available at famously reduced prices now. And um, it was a book. And if you read the book, you will find out that Israel fought that war without any American bullets. Now, France was our sometimes ally back then. There was no U.S. Israel strategic alliance. I States embargoed Israel. But on the seventh day of that war, American policymakers woke up and said, well, there is this superpower out there. It's a little one, but it just defeated two major Soviet-backed armies. Maybe we should be allied with that country. And thus began the U.S.-Israel strategic alliance, which has become one of the most multifaceted and deepest strategic alliances the United States has with any country. And it includes everything. It's joint maneuvers. It's weapons development like Iron Dome, David's Sling, the Arrow 2, Arrow 3. These are joint projects. Every American fighter pilot, whether a fixed wing or helicopter pilot, wears an American-made helmet, an Israeli-made helmet. Amazing helmet. You look down the ground, you don't see the ground. You, see, you, don't, you don't see the, the floor of the plane, you see the ground. 2,000 feet below. Every, is, every American combat soldier carries an Israeli-made bandage, a high-tech bandage. 
the intelligence cooperation, unmatched by any else, else in the world. So you have these three pillars. I can't think of another country in the world in which the United States has a spiritual connection, a democratic shared values, and a military alliance. It's the United States and Italy, United States and France, a spiritual connection, not quite. You put it all together, and you have a very special relationship indeed. But does this mean we agree on everything? Guess what? We do not. There are some deep-seated, serious agreements that are not new. Some of them go back to 1948, like Jerusalem. President Truman recognized Israel, but he didn't recognize Israel's capital. He made Tel Aviv Israel's capital, and it's an anomaly. I can't think of any of the two countries in the world where one member of an alliance doesn't recognize the capital of the other. And I will tell you right now, from the bima of Kol Yisrael, <laughs> Israel recognizes Washington, D.C. As, as, as the United States capital. I've got no problem with it. But we can't get the American embassy to move out, of, move out of Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is our capital, our eternal capital. Um, we disagree over settlements. And that's a disagreement that goes back to Lyndon Johnson. It goes back to the immediate aftermath of the Six-Day War. The first settlement was made at the end of 1967. Long-standing differences. We have differences over American arms sales to the Arabs. Very deep-seated difference. America is the largest seller of arms in the Middle East today. Tens of billions of dollars. And hey, who knows in whose hands are these arms are going to be in another five years? We don't know. Big issue. So we have this great alliance, and we have divides. Growing up, not all that far from here, from our hometown in New Jersey, I could see the New York skyline. Uh, and uh, I always thought of myself as the sort of the embodiment of this alliance. Uh, I grew up at parents' house, uh, conservative Jews. Um, um, we're terribly religious, were we now? Not terribly, but you know, eh, eh. <laughs> uh, and, but I always thought myself inestimably lucky to be living at a time in Jewish history. Very early on, I was aware that there was somewhere out there there was a Jewish state, and I thought, wow, I happen to be alive at this time in Jewish history where there's a Jewish state, and, and I wasn't going to miss it. Um, but I had a number of problems and other challenges. First of all, you know, American kid, I was, I was fat and uncoordinated, and, um, you know, um, and I had terrible learning disabilities. They put me in a dumb class in school. Um, I wanted to be a writer someday, but it was going to be a real challenge because I couldn't spell. Uh, I wanted to be an athlete, I had a problem because I couldn't run. Uh, I wanted to be the girl of my dreams, but I couldn't get a date to the prom, the whole, the whole thing. Um, and I wanted to be an Israeli. I wanted to be Israeli, and, uh, and, but in a true sort of American uh, way, I went out to live out my dreams. Uh, I worked every year shoveling snow, mowing lawns, to save up enough money so that in the summer I could go to work in Israel for free. That's pretty crazy. But I got to be a cowboy. I got to be a cowboy on the Golan Heights. I was a Jewish cowboy. Wasn't that cool? I used to call myself Oi Rogers. <laughs> Just dated yourselves. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, I, I, taught myself how to, I taught myself how to spell, and I, I did become a writer. And I became involved in Zionist activities. And when I was 15 years old, as part of a Zionist youth movement, I went to Washington, D.C. for the first time. I went to the White House for the first time, the Capitol for the first time. I don't remember any of that, but I do remember the meeting with Israel's ambassador to Washington. And he walked in, and we all you know, sang Avengu Shalom Aleichem. And I got to shake his hand. And it was a transformative moment for me. Because uh, I thought to myself, right there, that's what I want to be when I grow up. When I was 15, I decided I wanted to be Israel's ambassador to the United States. And his name was Yitzhak Rabin. And he was the great hero of the Six-Day War. And uh, a great role model for me. And eventually I lived out that dream. I moved to Israel and, uh, and served in the army. Um, met the girl who wouldn't go to the prom with me. Uh, <laughs> later became the mother of my children and the grandmother of my grandchildren. And... Uh, and lived out that Israeli dream. Now, parts of that Israeli dream were very, very difficult. As, as a soldier, I was in war, and you've heard about before my time in the Soviet Union. Uh, we lost a close family member uh, to terror. Our son was wounded in action. Uh, and I got to work for Yitzhak Rabin, but about two months later, he was assassinated. And I attended, filed past his casket holding my, my young son's hand. So there were was, there was tremendous challenges and disappointments and tragedies. But all in all, the uh, the Israeli experience for me, uh, at the end of the day, was, was, was luminous. 
and just terribly uplifting and inspiring. And, and then in 2009, I got to live out my ultimate dream. I got a call from Prime Minister Netanyahu telling me that I have been named as Israel's ambassador uh, to the United States. And I come to this job um, at a particular time where the divides between the two countries are yawning, yawning very widely indeed. Uh, the Middle East is unraveling. Who would know that in another couple of years there really wouldn't be much of an Iraq? I don't want to upset anybody here, but there's no more Syria anymore. Um, the entire Middle East, as we had known it for, for a century, was disappearing. Who would know that the United States was about to fall into the deepest economic crisis since the Great Depression? That there'd be terrible political polarization in the United States. Republicans and Democrats wouldn't be talking to another. Terrible war weariness after so many years of, of conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then, all of a sudden, elections that, within a very short period of time, bring into office two individuals who are two of the most mismatched individuals you could ever imagine. Uh, you have Benjamin Netanyahu and, and uh, Barack Obama. And if you look at their resumes, that's where it begins. I mean, because if you look at uh, uh, Netanyahu's resume, it, it, it's rather intimidating. Here's a guy who uh, serves in Seret Matkal, Israel's Delta Force. He's an officer there. He goes to MIT. He's an honor graduate of MIT. He gets an MA in MIT. He's an economist. He becomes the, the uh, deputy ambassador in Washington. He becomes the ambassador to the UN. He becomes a finance minister, a foreign minister, a deputy prime minister, prime minister, 20 years of legislative, uh, of, uh, legislative uh, experience in the Knesset. And opposite him is uh, Barack Obama, who hasn't had any of this experience, he hasn't had the military, the economic, the financial, the, uh, the legislative, uh, the diplomatic experience, very different resumes. But beyond the, just the pure um, experiential differences between them, there are deep seated differences in worldviews. Uh, Barack Obama's worldview is one in which the United States is not going to be the policeman of the world anymore. America is going to work in a collegial factor, in a collegial manner with other nations in the world. It is going to have a high regard for international institutions like the UN, which aren't particularly friendly to Israel. It is going to uh, recoil, not just from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but recoil from a, a massive use of armed force. And many people in the world had gotten, had gotten used to the fact that the United States was willing to project power. And one of the most, I think, revealing lines ever spoken by the president was back in 2010, where he said, whether we like it or not, America is the world's leading military superpower. Think about that, whether we like it or not. Some of us wake up in the morning and say, Abraha, that America is the world's leading military power, because once upon a time there were other military powers that weren't so friendly. Um, and it was going to be a significant reach out to the Muslim world, including uh, to Iran, an attempt to get onto a new footing and reach a nuclear arrangement with Iran. More about that later, of course. Netanyahu's worldview, very different. It is a worldview deeply informed by the Inquisition, the expulsions, by the Holocaust. You will never find a speech by Netanyahu that doesn't touch all of those bases. Very dark worldview. Um, Obama is maybe the, the epitome of political correctness. Netanyahu hates political correctness. He will never use the word paradigm, ever. <laughs> Trust me, I work on his speeches. Um, no paradigm. Um, when Obama comes into the White House, he takes a bust of Winston Churchill that was put into the Oval Office as a gift to the British. He moves it elsewhere in the White House. When Netanyahu comes into his office, he takes a big portrait of Winston Churchill and hangs it immediately over his left shoulder in his office so that Winston Churchill is always looking down on him. Can't get much deeper than that, can you? But in addition to that, then, there comes the policy differences, the actual policy differences. Now, since the, the mid-80s, since the mid-Reagan years at least, the American-Israel relationship had rested on two principles. The principle, first principle was no daylight. What does that mean, no daylight? By the way, you can't even translate it into Hebrew. No daylight means that if you're going to have a difference over settlements, over Jerusalem, whatever you're going to have a difference about, you can have a difference, but it's better to have the difference behind closed doors and not have it outside so that our common enemies can't enjoy it. And right off the bat, that principle gets thrown off. Uh, Netanyahu comes to Washington in May uh, 2009. I was at his first meeting at the White House. And the demand is made for a settlement freeze, for uh, recognition of the two-state solution, 
uh, a freeze of all Jewish building in Jerusalem uh, over the 1967 lines. And that demand is made not just in the Oval Office, it's made very, very publicly, immediately publicly, and becomes a major crisis right then and there. So daylight, so it's no daylight. Uh, a month, the, the next great uh, problem begins a month later. The other, the other, the other pillar of the relationship, the other, the other, the other principle was no surprises. And, and no surprises means that if the United States is going to make a major policy statement, on the Middle East in ways that impact Israel. Israel's going to get advance notice of that. So, for example, in 2002, when President Bush issued the roadmap, Arik Sharon, the Prime Minister at the time, got a draft of this before Bush went public with it. And we were able to submit our comments. That was thrown out, too. Um, a month after that meeting with uh, Netanyahu, June 2009, Obama goes to Cairo. He gives the Cairo speech. The Cairo speech is a very long speech. It's twice as long as the first inaugural address. And it contains many things that relate to Israel, a call for settlement freeze, call for this two-state solution. Um, it recognizes for the first time by an American president Iran's right to have a peaceful nuclear energy program. It, it has an incredible line in this, no country should ever determine whether another country should or should not have nuclear weapons. So imagine, we're reading this, but we got no advance warning of this whatsoever. Complete surprise. And then Obama skips over Israel and goes to Saudi Arabia and then to Buchenwald. Um, but this was all a surprise for Israel. So these two principles right from the outset were discarded. Now, to be fair, and we did our fair, we did our share of surprise in the Obama administration. Uh, Vice President Biden comes to Jerusalem and someone gets the bright idea in the interior ministry to announce that in another seven years they're gonna build 1,600 units in a neighborhood called uh, Ramat Shlomo. Anybody know where it is? It's actually in Northwest Jerusalem. Not even East Jerusalem, but it's over the 67 lines, and that causes a crisis. And of course, Netanyahu surprised the president uh, last March in his speech before Congress. That was a big surprise. But these, for the most part, the surprises, certainly during my period, uh, were inadvertent, and we apologized. It wasn't a matter of policy. And, um, and in fact, you know, we did our best to try to meet the president when the prime minister in June 2009 gives the Bar Ilan speech where he accepts uh, the two-state solution when he uh, issues the first ever settlement building freeze at the end of 2009, the moratorium. Um, these were efforts to try to get on track with Obama, but it didn't work. At the end of the day, the settlement issue kept on coming up, and even uh, when John Kerry did his nine-month uh, mediation, that's, this is now 2013-2014, at the end of that mediation, when the Palestinians walked away from the table, when Israel accepted Kerry's uh, framework agreement, uh, Kerry went before the Senate and said, Israel built 700 units in a settlement, and the process went poof. Where was the settlement? The settlement was Gilo, in Jerusalem, which no Israelis think of as a settlement, and I spent 24 hours on Israeli television trying to find the Hebrew equivalent to the word poof, <laughs> which doesn't exist. It's a Yiddish word, Fife. But uh, no word for poof. So that, that was a disagreement that kept on getting wider. Um, but I don't want you to give the impression that everything was disagreement. It, that would be a misleading one. And there were many ways, particularly in the military cooperation, in intelligence cooperation, in which the Obama administration exceeded uh, previous administrations. And uh, I had uh, one particular example, which will always remain for me a, a, a very a sharp reminder of this special relationship between the United States and Israel. And it's, it's, it's an example from, the, from December 1st, 2010. December 1st, 2010, I was going to the Hanukkah party at the White House. Anybody ever been to the Hanukkah party at the White House? <laughs> no, you have, Karen's been there, yes, you've been there. It is a surreal event because you have uh, a thousand Jews, many of whom are from, uh, some of whom are very from, Right, and they are all nibbling latkes under Christmas trees <laughs> because the, the White House is already decorated for Christmas. So you have this very strange look. Um, and I was going into the uh, into the into the, the Hanukkah party that night, and um, as I was crossing the Pennsylvania Avenue to go into the front of the building, I had my telephone my cell phone rings, and on the phone is Benjamin Netanyahu, and he's using, he's, in, he's talking to me in a voice I'd never heard before and I hope never to hear again, telling me that a terrific fire has broken out in the Carmel Forest 
and that 26 people have already been killed in the first hour. And Israel does not have any fire extinguishing planes. Israel has run out of retardant. That's that brown stuff they throw out of the back of planes. And there's nothing stopping this fire from descending on Haifa. And the Prime Minister tells me, go directly to the President and tell him that we need planes and we need retardant. And I said, well, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, of course, I'm going to the White House right now. I'll go directly to the President. I go into the White House, and this is where it's very important to come from West Orange, New Jersey, because the Chief of Staff, Michelle Obama, was a girl woman who graduated from my high school and whose father played tennis with my father. And I said to her, Susan, I gotta see the, I gotta see the president right away. We got this situation in, in the Carmel Forest. She brought me right into the president. I tell uh, President Obama the message from the prime minister, Israel needs you. And he, the President Obama immediately turns to his aide, uh, Reggie Love, tall basketball player, he says, he says to Reggie, you get the Israelis everything they need. And that night, uh, we opened up a, a, uh, an emergency room in the West Wing in the National Security Council. That night, I didn't know, right after the Hanukkah party, uh, the president flew to Afghanistan. The first thing he did when he got into Afghanistan was to call back to the White House to find out if Israel has gotten its planes. And uh, the United States, it turns out, has 11 firefighting planes. Israel got eight of them. The US military scoured the warehouses of NATO to get us a retardant. There's even this group of, of hot spotters, these are these, these commandos who parachute behind uh, flames and put out flames. They left Idaho that night and, and arrived in Israel the next day to take part in the, the extinguishing effort, and the fire was contained, also with the help of the United States of America. But those moments of great alliance couldn't overshadow the divides, and at the end of the day, the biggest divide we had was over the Iranian nuclear deal. And what can I say? This is a, I had the privilege duty of participating in five years of very intimate talks with our American counterparts on Iran. And we had two major differences with them. One was so simple, it's almost stupid, it's structural. The United States, I hope this is not going to surprise anybody again, the United States is a very big country, it's far away from the Middle East, it's not threatened with national annihilation by the Iranians, and you have the most powerful military in the world. Israel is a small country, we are in Iran's backyard, we are threatened with genocide by the Iranian regime, even by the current one. And we have a great army. It's twice, more than twice as big as the French and British army combined, but we don't have aircraft carriers, we do not have strategic bombers, which means that our margin for error on Iran is exactly zero, exactly zero. Can't make one mistake. And then there was the conceptual difference. This goes back to that, that sort of worldview. We, the, the Obama administration believed that the Iranian regime was a rational regime that it made decisions on a cost-benefit analysis, and if properly engaged, could be, quote-unquote, become, could, could, quote, quote, become a, reg a responsible regional power. And could, quote-unquote, I'm quoting the president here, could, quote-unquote, help resolve the Sunni-Shiite divide. We believed that the Iran regime was an irrational regime. That irrational regimes sometimes take rational moves to reach irrational goals, that's what the Nazis did. And that when these people talked about wiping Israel off the map, they meant it. And we had to take them very seriously. And their position, the administration's position, led to the Iranian nuclear deal, which I'm in Knesset, and we agree on nothing in that Knesset. You know, if the, the seats aren't screwed down, we'll throw it at each other. <laughs> but in Israel, there was something close to a national consensus that this was a bad deal. It wasn't just Netanyahu, it was a bad deal. And for many reasons, I can go into it for another hour, it's a bad deal. But at the end of the day, it was passed. And, and, and basically confirmed by the, by, by the Congress, by the Senate, and now we have the deal. And now we have no choice but to move forward and to engage in yet another intimate dialogue with our American counterparts um, about the ways in which the United States can aid Israel uh, in overcoming the challenges created by the new Middle East, but beyond the Middle East, the challenges actually generated by this Iranian nuclear deal. And this is something we're going to have to talk about, because Israel get, currently gets $3.1 billion a year in USA. We may need more of that. Even though most of that aid is spent in the United States, we may need more to meet these challenges. And this is going to be the nature of that dialogue. This dialogue will take place over the course of the next year, the last year of the Obama administration, and we will continue to have these differences, both over our readings of Iran, We've made a, a very strong point about Iranian testing of missiles, and the Obama administration has not made a big issue of the Iranian testing of missiles. Um, and over the peace process, 
particularly if the French and the New Zealanders start moving in the UN to try to change the, uh, the basis for peacemaking. The big question is whether the United States will or will not veto that effort. Uh, we will have those differences, but beyond those differences, there's going to remain the fundamental alliance. It's that spiritual, democratic, military alliance which is totally unique in the world, because at the end of the day, listen, Israel has no substitute for the United States as its ultimate ally. We just don't. There's no other country that shares our value. There's no other country that's going to give us that $3.1 billion a year military aid. There's no other country in the world where 70 cents have said the population is pro-Israel. And Israel support in this country is at an all-time high. And frankly, the United States has no substitute for the state of Israel. There's no other country in the Middle East, and not just in the Middle East, which is militarily, scientifically, technologically proficient, which is unerringly democratic, and which is unreservedly, proudly pro-American. No other country in the world like that. And for that reason, and for many others, the word ally <laughs> remains the, one of the most beautiful <laughs> words in the English language, Ben Brit, one of the beautiful, most beautiful concepts in the Hebrew language. Both of them will continue to apply to the U.S. as a relationship. Guarantee it. Ta-da. Thank you, Michael. That was excellent. I'd like to invite Mary Mizrahi to conduct our Q&A. So, obviously. Um, the format of the Q&A will be, um, we did receive some questions in advance for the last few days when people came earlier tonight. Um, we're going to let the ambassador sit for a couple of minutes, relax. He was just talking to us for a half an hour. Uh, he came this morning from Israel really early. So we're going to, you know, read off some of those questions, discuss them a little bit. Um, and then we're going to open up the questions in the entire room, and anyone can ask anything they want to the ambassador directly. So it should be a lot of fun, uh, and we're looking forward uh, to hearing more. And, uh, so here it goes. Well, the first question is an easy one. Um, when can we have you again? <laughs> it's not up to me. Thank you. The problem is, in Israel right now, it's an answer we have the smallest uh, coalition majority uh, in our history. It's 61 to 59. And um, if, uh, if a member of Knesset from the coalition is not present, then the, co then the government can fall. Knesset meets on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, which means I can only leave on Wednesday night, come in on Thursday, and go back on Wednesday Shabbat. Uh, to the so basically, in between that time, I am a prisoner of Zion. <laughs> um, and the, the opposition is trying to wear us down through a war of attrition. I'll teach you a great Hebrew word. Great Hebrew. Impress all your friends. How do you say filibuster in Hebrew? Filibuster. We have several filibuster in the week. We just wait until 1, 2, 5, 6 in the morning with long speeches, trying to get us to collapse physically. Uh, so someone will fall asleep and not vote, and the government will fall. <laughs> and they come very close, especially with me. And, uh, and so that's the problem. It's, it's getting out. Okay, so hopefully in the next slide. Give us the biggest prayer coalition, I'll be happy. Exactly. Uh, next question. What is the most important things American Jews can do to support Israel? Uh, calm. Certainly <laughs> um, calm to visit Israel. Uh, you know, if you're not inclined to actually move to Israel, support Israel, um, support um, your elected representatives who support Israel, make your voices heard uh, through your elected representatives, extremely important. Uh, be involved in, uh, in advocacy, uh, in campuses, in the media. There are wonderful organizations that are, that are acting in the advocacy field. Um, be active, be active. Our, our biggest challenge, we talk about challenges on campuses all the time, BDS, anti-Israel speakers. The biggest challenge we have in American campuses is their apathy. You get campuses that have you know 20, 30 percent Jewish population. About 10 kids were involved in the, in the Israel, you know, in the Israel call. Um, that's very common. And uh, so, being active is the best thing. You touched on apathy. Yeah. How do we change that? I think that. Uh, I, usually, where people are Jewishly engaged, they are engaged with Israel. You know? uh, so one way you do it is through better Jewish education, a greater sense of Jewish identity, and proving that Judaism is, is relevant to our lives. 
Um, but also getting kids engaged. I was, I was, Sally worked for many years for Birthright. I was uh, for many years was represented on the Birthright board uh, through organization, through, through activities such as Birthright, where kids who maybe don't have a particularly deep Jewish background come to Israel and they encounter Jewish peoplehood for the first time. Um, it is for many of them a transformative experience, and interestingly enough, it's very transformative for the Israelis who take part in it too, because they have never encountered Jewish people. Uh, it's amazing. I always tell the story of our, our daughter Leah, who was a sergeant in the Golani Brigade, uh, met a group of Canadian Jews in birthright. You know, they have soldiers who go along with them, and, and she called home, and she was crying hysterically. And Sally said, why are you crying? She says, well, I'm the boss, and we're going to Jerusalem. And Sally said to Leah, but Leah, you live in Jerusalem. You were born in Jerusalem. Why are you crying? And she said, I'm crying because everybody's crying. So for Leah, it was also an encounter with Jewish people. These Canadian Jews, what do I have in common with these people? Who are they? They're mishpoch. Sometimes we have to be reminded of that. So they're wow. So moving on, you touched a lot on the Iranian issue. Yeah. If you were prime, this question comes from the SEA president, Mr. Jaime Shama. Uh, if you were the prime minister, how would you have handled the Iran issue differently? Or well, similarly? Um, well, the book actually deals with this at length. And um, um, I talk about the debates within Israeli decision making circles about how to handle this. Here you have an administration which, almost from its first day, has set out to make a nuclear agreement with Iran. We all know this. And we became wiser later. It turns out that the president in his first weeks in office was already, was already being conducted a correspondence with the Supreme Leader of the Khomeini uh, and there were other dealers out there. Um, so how do you deal with it? One way we dealt with it was, it, and the question is whether you should be very much out front and confronting the president at every, every stop uh, and screaming and yelling, or do you take a much more sort of muted approach uh, work beneath the radar. Um, my position was that if we could show more flexibility on the peace process, we could dig in our heels deeper on the Iranian issue. Um, and then the president, the prime minister, would get up in front of Congress and say, "Listen, you know how far I went for the peace process. When I tell you that this Iran deal is bad, believe me." Um, that would have given us more street credit. The, uh, the and sometimes the prime minister went along with it, but mostly he was, he was of the opinion. If we didn't make our opinion felt and felt very strongly, that uh, we would be, be trampled on by this agreement. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, there was probably no way we could have stopped it. We are a small country. The United States is uh, the world's largest superpower, whether we like it or not. And uh, and we like it. And um, and we did have a, a material impact on it because without Israel screaming and yelling and threatening, there probably would not have been sanctions. And, I think the Prime Minister deserves a tremendous amount of credit for that. And he hasn't been given the credit for that he deserves for this um, But the debates will continue, and I think this is one of those cases. I say this as an historian. Uh, historians look back 50, 60, 100 years from now, and they will see things very differently than we see. That, that much I can guarantee you. And if Iran emerges after 13, 15 years of this agreement and makes 200 nuclear weapons with the infrastructure that it is as retained, that history will look back on Benjamin Netanyahu and say he was the man who won the world and got it right. Um, we shall know. But rather, your kids and grandkids will know. All right, um, here's another question. Currently, there are 11 to 12 seats in the Knesset held by Arab parties. Yes. Some of these parties are based on the destruction of our country. If you are prime minister, how would you, what would you do to change this situation? There's a, there is a, a United Arab List of, of, uh, of 13 <coughs> members, um, and they do not recognize the legitimacy of the Jewish state. They will not sing a tikva. Um, they, um, they are not, in that way, they're not all that different from some of the parading party. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've also all sing a tikva. Um, um, but with the Arabs, it's a different thing because they necessarily will not always condemn terror, as we've seen here in recent weeks. Um, and they will almost never justify uh, Israel's use of force, ever, ever. I think if I were a prime minister, I don't be prime minister, as a member of the Knesset, my position is this. 
that um, it, a democracy uh, bestow, it bestows uh, rights on individuals. And in Israeli democracy, those rights are far reaching. They are, in many ways, flagrantly democratic. I'd like to see a member of Congress not stand for the Star Spangled Banner and say that the United States Constitution has no right to exist. Right. Uh, he would stay in this position for about, what, 30 seconds, maybe? Uh, and, or let them support a terrorist organization like Hamas. So, you know, uh, uh, so we're flagrant there, guys. We bestow those rights, and I'm proud of those rights. The fact that we can have these discussions with, with Arabs, some of them are, most of them are Muslim, some of them are Christian, and we are two hour drive from ISIS in Syria is amazing. One of those was proudest accomplishments. But democracies also uh, demand and should receive obligation. You know, there are 250,000 Anglo Jews, and they have no problem saluting a flag that has not one but three crosses on it. They have no problem singing a national an anthem to the Queen of England, who also happens to be the head of the church of England. They don't have a problem just doing it. They'll fight for that flag. They'll die for that flag. Many, many of them have. Why can't an Arab Israeli salute our flag? Why can't he sing in that, our national anthem? It's basically understand that loyalty, and I'm not talking about loyalty oaths here, but loyalty is one of the pillars of democracy. Without loyalty, you don't have democracy. Very good. So it has to be a two way street. Yeah. It has to be a war against discrimination, full equality before the law. Certainly, on the other hand, a sense that they are a minority in a nation state, but they are a loyal minority. Could you explain your position on the Shaked bill, uh, the bill recently proposed by Ayal Shaked that wants to monitor the NGOs, and in your opinion, how that will impact uh, the democratic nature of Israel? Okay. For those of you who don't know about this bill, it has been proposed by um, by the D Party, by Ayal Shaked, who's our, our justice minister, uh, a very capable, outstanding member of Knesset. Minister, um, this bill is not the first time a bill like it has been proposed. It begins with the fact that Israel has per capita the largest number of NGOs operating in the world. Uh, some of these NGOs are political NGOs that work against the policies of the democratically elected government of Israel. Some of them actually work against the existence of the state of Israel. Some of them are actively seeking to delegitimize us in the world, like breaking the silence, uh, to give just one example. And they receive more than 50% of their funding from foreign governments in Europe. And the bill says, okay, if they're receiving foreign funding from your European governments, we should know that. And their representatives in Knesset, and they have lobbyists in Knesset, should wear a special tag that indicates that they are receiving more than 50% of their income from foreign countries. So what's the problem with that? It does not accord with the norms that are accepted in, in democratic countries, including the United States of America. Um, and um, the position of the United States of America is going to be funding, not just by foreign governments, but by all foreigners, that all should be transparent. And so the bill, which is designed to only go against those, those NGOs that are getting foreign government funding, is uh, clearly designed to single out the left-wing NGOs and not impact in any way to the right-wing NGOs or other NGOs. So it becomes a prejudicial type of uh, legislation, which is why I, even as a member of the coalition, I'm opposing this bill in its present form. I'm working to make changes in it, <coughs> because I believe not only will it uh, uh, deleteriously impact our <coughs> reputation as a democratic country, and our, as I talked about earlier, the, the sense that there is common and shared democratic values between us and the United States is a strategic interest to the state of Israel. It's not just to make you feel good. You know, I can't tell how many senators would call me and say, listen, I support you because you're a democracy. We don't want to fool around with that. But not only that, the legislation has to get a strength in those NGOs. Those NGOs are going to wear that tag and tear the tag of money. They're going to raise more money for it. They run around to the world telling the world that we're not a democratic country. Now they're going to say, look, you see how not that kind of democratic they are? They make me wear the tag. And they're just going to raise more money. So I'm twerking to make a change in the bill. I hope the changes can be in the bill. In its present form, I can't support it. I was elected to Knesset to, to protect Israel's foreign relations. And this will only harm Israel's foreign relations. Ten years after the Gaza abandonment, what are your thoughts? My thoughts about the abandonment uh, are that we made, a car we made a number of mistakes. Of course, we made a number of mistakes in the way the, the, uh, the 
residents, the Israeli Jewish residents of Gaza were, were handled, or mishandled. We made a mistake in withdrawing, I believe, to the 67 borders, but we didn't have to. And the biggest make mistake we made was, was waiting more than six months to respond to Hamas rocket fire. Hamas, in the six months after we threw the Gaza, Hamas fired a thousand rockets at us and we did nothing. And so Hamas internalized that they could fire at us with impunity. And we, if we had to withdraw, we should have said, anything comes over that border, I don't care if it's, if it's a slingshot ball, we're going to respond massively to it and create deterrence. We didn't do that. We're doing it now. You spoke a lot about um, construction in Judea and Samaria, particularly in Jerusalem. Yeah. Do you believe that that does hinder peace? And find hinder. peace. Well, find peace. I think it, uh, it, it, it hinders peace if you, if you make it an issue in the peace process. And, and uh, one of the things I'll point out in my writings is that uh, in 2005, uh, President Bush made an agreement <coughs> with Ariel Sharon Bush your own letter, which said, listen, we know that there have been changes on the ground. There are major settlement blocks, uh, Jewish Jerusalem. Over half the Jews in Jerusalem live over the 67 line. They don't, don't even know what the lines are anymore. Who knows? I mean, our kids grew up in a neighborhood that was in pre 16 as Israel, but right next to us are Mormon at Sea, which is over the 67 lines, and Gilo is over the 67 line. Um, and we're not going to make a big issue, this letter said. We're not going to make an issue of the settlement blocks. We're not going to make a big issue of the uh, of Jewish Jerusalem. And the Palestinians understood that, too. Um, and when Obama came to office, he disavowed the existence of this letter, which did two things. First of all, it, 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 it narrowed our latitude. Because if Israelis, every once in a while, there's a terrorist attack. They want to see that the government does something. They want to see that we're building. So you build the settlement blocks. You don't have to build in a far-flung settlement. And that doesn't impact the process. But it also, the Obama's position also denied the latitude to the Palestinians because uh, President uh, Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority could not be less Palestinian than the President of the United States. And the President of the United States said, Israel can't build anywhere, can't build in the blocks, can't build in East Jerusalem. And how can Mahmoud Abbas say, hey, I'm just going to look the other way? So anytime Israel built anywhere, and in Jerusalem, by the way, no prime minister. No, whether right, left, up, or down, has the right to stop Jewish building in Jerusalem with a sovereign Jewish territory. It was annexed in 1967. If anyone tries to stop it, they'll be taken to the Supreme Court and they will lose. It's illegal. Uh, so the president made an impossible demand on us, and anytime someone builds something in Gilo, the process went poof, the quote, uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, because President Abbas said, I can't join the process, they're building in the settlement. So that was it. So I think that that. Uh, Building in the blocks, building these Jerusalem should not have impacted this. I believe, and I am a member of a centrist party, we're part of the coalition, but we have a different position than many members of the coalition. I believe we should not be building in any area that will not be part of the Jewish state in the event that we ever reach a two-state solution. That doesn't mean we're going to reach it so quickly, but we should not. And should we adopt that position, we will take a huge amount of wind out of the sales of BDS and the boycotters of Europe. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, when a new administration comes in, may it be Republican or Democrat, we'll have more support for that type of position. Right now, we don't have it. So just to follow up on one of the points that you just made, mm -hmm. you said it's illegal for anyone to not allow construction in Jerusalem, if that was The Prime point. Minister cannot come out and say, you cannot build this building in Jerusalem. So in the and no more than the President of the United States can come out and say, you cannot build a building in Pittsburgh. It's sovereign Israeli territory. Does that mean that a divided Jerusalem, either imposed by a leftist Israeli government or a liberal American government, is impossible? It's, it, it, first of all, it, 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 practically it's impossible. You have mixed neighborhoods now. You have you know, French Hill, which is 35% Arab. How are you going to divide it? Um, and I mean, the America's policy on Jerusalem um, is, is neither applicable uh, nor is it free of prejudice, because according to that principle, uh, Jews can only build legally in certain parts of their capital, but Arabs can build anywhere, including illegally, in any part of the capital. <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, discrepancy. Uh, uh, so practically speaking, it's probably impossible, but also <coughs> legally speaking, uh, anybody who tried to redivide Jerusalem, they'd be hauled before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court would have to decide 
where there a, a, a decision made in July of 1967, uh, formally annexing former Jordanian Jerusalem, is, is a legal precept that can be overturned by, you know, a simple, uh, by a government decision and any type of uh, uh, plurality in the mess. Okay, uh, this question is mine, and then I'd like to open it up to the floor. Uh, who is your favorite <coughs> biblical figure? Uh, <laughs> my favorite biblical figure is. Um, I have a few. Um, I love Gideon. 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 My my kind of judge. Why you have to elaborate a little bit? He was he was a, he was a, he was a great practitioner. He knew he knew. He knew human nature and its relation to politics and, and, and battlefield strategy. He had that great scene at the, this, the, uh, the stream of uh, cold and then cold, where he invites fighters in and he watches how they drink water. And some of them get down and drink like dogs. They stick their head the heads in the water. And some of them raise the water up like their lips. And those are the ones he takes as fighters because they're men. They're, they're, they're cultured men. And he understands that to be a great warrior, you ask all to have to be a man of character. You know, it's a wonderful story. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll open up the floor now to questions. Uh, we'll try and call on as many people as possible in the short time that we have. Please speak loudly. Please introduce yourself by name. If you have a position that you want to make known, do that as well. But please say your name, your question loudly, slowly, clearly, so everyone can hear. Uh, I think Rabbi Bad, Rabbi Eli Bad, uh, you had a question earlier. Would you like to address yes. it thank, thank you. Um, the question is regarding the plight of the Jewish refugees from Arab countries. Israel passed a law a year and a half ago recognizing December 1st as a day of commemoration. And also, a resolution was passed by the Knesset several years ago, the Nassim Zaev bill. Uh, also uh, calling upon the Israeli government that in any negotiations with the Palestinian Arabs that the plight of the Jewish refugees from Arab countries should be brought. And at that time, Tsipi Livni was in charge of those negotiations and she said, no, definitely not. I don't recognize that population. Right. And, uh, but now I understand the Israeli government has taken upon itself through Minister Gila Gabriel that that will be a very, very important dossier in any negotiations. Um, and the answer to that is yes. Um, I, you know, I was telling people earlier, we don't have caucuses in Knesset, but the word caucus in Hebrew means coconut. Yes. <laughs> we have a So there is a shtula, there's a lobby right. for uh, the refugees from uh, Arab and Eastern countries uh, in Knesset, and I participate in that lobby. And we met on December 1st. And we reaffirmed our commitment uh, to this. Um, the, not just numerically, uh, the, the Jews from Arab countries and, and Islamic countries. <coughs> We've seen the number of baby Palestinian refugees, but just in terms of, 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 uh, of financial interests and assets, just in terms of territory, Jews from Arab countries left behind territory which is larger than the state of Israel. Four times. Four times, just to be exact. Okay. Believe this is going to come up. This is going to be in the negotiation. Any negotiations? Has to. So just so Our everyone problem. knows, Rabbi Batty is very involved in that process. <laughs> <laughs> more times. I have heard that. Yes, more times. Hi, uh, Rabbi Tal. Mm -hmm. I just uh, again just want to thank uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, so um, so I'll phrase it in a very politically correct way. Uh, you're not a rabbi, are you? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> you're just making sure so uh, legally I can ask you. Uh, this I don't know if you're a rabbi too. <laughs> exactly, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so who are you looking forward to uh, seeing um, take over Obama's post in uh, 2016? <laughs> <laughs> and of course I can't answer that. <laughs> of course I can't answer that. Well, I, I know many of the Republican candidates. I work extensively with Hillary Clinton. I think, you know, irrespective of who's uh, uh, elected, it's going to be it's going to be a different outlook. It's going to be a different relationship to the to the, to the projection of American power. I'm I don't expect there's going to be a major change uh, unilaterally uh, on America's relationship with Iran, but Iran may precipitate a different American change. Right now, Iran seems willing. Really, it seems able to do just about anything 
and not elicit a, a serious response from the administration. We've seen what happened to the sailors, we've seen what's happened to the missile tests. The administration is so deeply committed to this nuclear arrangement. Whatever they do, it's okay as long as they're keeping the nuclear arrangement. Um, that may change in a different administration, even in a possibly in a, in a democratic administration. So uh, and that would be different. Other than that, I think the, the core um, of, the, of the military aid is strategic alliance will maintain. My hope is that those two principles that I've talked about, no daylight and no surprises, will be restored. And that has to be a, a concerted effort made by the next administration together with the Israeli government. I hope that the next uh, administration will cooperate with Israel if it decides to take unilateral measures in the West Bank, which would be in Samaria, and say, okay, we're not going to build in these areas, but we need support of the United States. You're not going to get it from this administration, they get it from the future administration. Thank you. I'm Joe Clark. Thank hey, you, Joe. Thanks again. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, the special relationship that the United States has historically with Israel is one thing. The rest of the world, though, their relationship is with oil, and solely with oil. They don't have that special relationship. Uh, as the Mideast blows up in, in, in front of our eyes, the oil that's there is probably most valuable to China. Mm -hmm. I think that somebody once said that, uh, that the Arabs, if they see an American on, side, on the other side of a gun, they know if they kill enough of us, we're out of there. Yeah. If they see a Chinese on the other side of a gun, they are very worried. It's China's oil that they want. Couldn't, couldn't the collapse in the Mideast portend, portend a, an invasion, as you said a second ago, as you said, that we're tired of having the United States being world policemen. Could China come in there, and would that be enormously interesting? Right. Well, China Russia doesn't need the oil, but uh, I have kind of a surprising answer to your surprising question. <laughs> and the answer is no for two reasons. One is that China has not yet developed the capacity for production <coughs> force in that way, though they're working at it. They're building that type of fleet. Right now, America maintains the two largest naval forces in human history, the 5th and 6th Fleet, both from around the Persian Gulf area. Those fleets were created to protect the oil lanes, uh, the oil supply from the Middle East to the United States. The United States is now almost completely free of Middle Eastern oil. So what are those fleets doing there? They're protecting the oil supplies to China. Why? Because the United States economy is very much dependent on the Chinese economy. And you ask me, it's a very good investment. <laughs> uh, so right now, the answer is, you know, if China's threatened, it's the United States. It's still going to be. Yeah. All right, Shamba. A lot of people think that President Obama has his secret agenda in which he feels that he would like to promote the opinion of the world about Muslims and that he is looking to lessen the world's respect for Israel. Is there any truth to that? I think he has an he has, he's, he's nothing secret about it. He was very open about it. Um, I think you, you, can, you can say, you know, you've been critical of the, the president in many ways, but you can't criticize his lack of candor um, and his lack of consistency. He's very consistent. I listened to the State of the Union address, so that I was amazing how consistent that was from his first State of the Union address. His first, his first inaugural address talked about quote, closing Guantanamo. He's still talking about closing. <laughs> so he, he's very consistent, and, um, and he, he had a certain position, a certain view of Israel, and he's spoken about it. His view of Israel is an idealized view of Israel. He, the Israel he respects is the pre-67 Israel. He gave a talk in my old show in Washington where he said the Israel he respects the, is the Israel of the principles and moral character of, of, Mo, of Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan. A lot of Israelis thought that was kind of funny. Moral character, but okay. <laughs> uh, and um, that's an idealized Israel, which, which in fact never existed, and holds us up to a standard we can't meet because we are a normal country facing abnormal circumstances. But you know that that's a, he's not anti israel really just admires a different type of Israel. And he himself said, "You don't have to you, you don't have to be pro Likud to be pro Israel. So what can you do? The club, the club runs the country right now. We're they're the dominant party." Netanyahu was a Likudnik. Uh, he said it openly. Um, it wasn't Netanyahu who said, you know, you don't have to be pro-Democrat to be pro-American. <coughs> sure. 
for me. I'll get to you. <laughs> she's, she's asking me. People are asking me. Urgently over there, yes. Uh, my name is Joseph Ancona. I wanted to know if your claim lead please uh, gain momentum in the Knesset. My plan B. Yeah, it has. Plan B was, was, was you should know, was uh, the notion that, that if there is no Palestinian sitting opposite us at the negotiating table, we should take matters and draw them down. You can't say the word unilateralism in Israel anymore, it's a bad word. But everyone knows what we're talking about. And what's interesting is that outside of, um, say, the far right, um, just about everybody disagrees. I, I could sit with members of the, the Zionist camp um, and we'll have almost no disagreement on what we should be doing. There's some disagreements about where, you know, if, if, if Israel takes you know, and allow just how far they should go. But all, everybody pretty much understands it's never going to be on the other side of the table right now. It won't be for the future. And, and Palestinians have turned down two offers of states. Um, we don't see anybody coming up who's going to accept that offer. Um, and if we want to preserve ourselves as a democratic and Jewish state, we're going to have to keep it a way of sort of not incorporating two and a half million Palestinians and Jews marry into our state. That's simple. Uh, does that mean that I don't, if you think these areas are part of Eretz Israel that they don't belong to us? They belong to us. And if I had my druthers, I would, you know, I'd annex them tomorrow. But we can't. And we can't not maintain our position in the world and not maintain ourselves as a democratic and Jewish state. That's the reality. It's a bitter one. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Hello, we got there. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so two questions. Go ahead. Uh, the first one is, could you discuss a little bit about the unique opportunity for an Israeli-Saudi cooperation at mm -hmm. this time? And the second one is a follow-up to Rabbi Tal's question. Is there one particular candidate that stands out in your mind as being particularly more pro-Israel than others? I can't really ask. I, I'm an elected official. I can't answer the same. I can just say that I, I work with a number of the, the Republicans. I've worked with them. They're all you know, pro Israel. Um, some of their positions sort of dovetail more closely than the Israeli government. And so I can't endorse anybody. I can't. I just, you know, um, as for the, the Saudi principle, they're, 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 I think they're. There's a, a rat, there's a danger of inflating our hopes about the, about the extent of, uh, of Israeli and Saudi cooperation. It is true that there is a greater confluence of uh, interest between Saudi Arabia and Israel now than any time in the last 68 years. We agree on Syria, we agree on ISIS, we agree on uh, Iran, we agree on America, um, because if the president thought he would bring Arabs and Israelis closer together through peace, he has actually brought us closer together, but not through peace, but through common concern over his policies. Um, and, um, but Saudi Arabia rem remains a Wahhabi state. They just paid 60, 60 people like last week. They're the custodians of Mecca and Medina. They're not going to publicly embrace the Jewish state. They will, however, implicitly help us. And they have implicitly helped us in our last rounds of fighting with Hamas in Gaza. They've helped us on the Iranian issue. Uh, and I don't think we should try to like force it too much out in the open. Uh, when I was in Washington, we, we tried to advance a very, very simple program of getting the Saudis to agree to let Israeli planes fly over Saudi airspace going to India and China, which would have saved our travelers three hours. We have to go down and around and up, and uh, the Saudis turned us down. We have just a few more questions, and then we'll start to wrap it up. Hi, uh, A.B. Shaman, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, what needs to happen in our lifetime to achieve peace? <coughs> what needs to happen? Uh, any of you guys in Mashiach? <laughs> <laughs> Please step forward right now. <laughs> what needs to happen in our, in our lifetime to have peace? Uh, Um, it depends on how you define peace. It does. Um, I define peace in, in a Middle Eastern way, not in a Western way. Uh, the, Middle East, the Western way resembles sort of a kumbaya session. In the Middle East, it's, it's much more stability uh, and the absence of violence. And that is attainable. That is attainable if uh, Israel works very proactively in assuring that there's a political horizon for the Palestinians. It doesn't have to be realized in the next, you know, the near future, but a political horizon. 
Uh, we enable them to develop economically. We enable them to move freely uh, to the degree that's, you know, that's in concert with our security in interests. And we create what I call a two-state situation. It's not two-state solution, but it's a situation. Uh, it's an article I wrote in the Wall Street Journal some months ago. You can look it up. It's called the two-state situation. Um, and that would create greater stability. And the Middle East is always going to be greater stability. Um, it's never going to be absolute stability. And we can move to greater stability. That can happen in your lifetime, and who knows? It might even happen in mine. Um, <laughs> you know, particularly optimistic. Um, peace, peace, peace. The Middle East is, is royally. Even the President and the State of the Union address it the other night that this is going to be a matter of generations, not years. Wow. It's like an Israeli audience. <laughs> On the other side of the beam, you know, I can't. So it's just a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Just be, be Israeli and stand up. First of all, I just want to say thank you for your service. Thank you for everything you've done for Israel. Assumption was that to invade Japan would cost 
Right, Dad? It cost a quarter of a million American soldiers. He was going to go to Japan from Europe. Today, the historians are calling Truman, you know, a butcher. Looks different. Either way, Truman loses. Either way. Such as it is with, such as it is with, with decision making to this day. Did he make a right decision to now, or he did not? But just like Jonah, the lesson of Jonah is there's no escaping from <coughs> the responsibility of decision making. And for those of you who are thinking about a political future, read the book of Jonah. It's only a page and a half. <laughs> 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 Charles Cohen, the United States is coming to a very pertinent time in the history of the country with all of the elected officials that are running for the position of the president. Yeah. Not to mention any names, we have a lot of front runners in this position today that are telling us that if I become to be president, I'm going to do this <coughs> and I'm going to do that. How they do that? Exactly what they're going to do. <laughs> I don't want to indicate exactly what they're going to do. Right. How credible do you think the Senate and the Congress are going to go along with him to overturn what has been done in this past administration to correct the strategic stability of the regions necessary, okay, to stabilize this problem? I think that uh, a lot of it depends on who's controlling the Congress, which party. And a lot of it depends on the security situation at the time and the economic situation at the time. I think that any democracy, and I'm operating in a democratic environment, um, moves very, very reluctantly to undo legislation of previous administration, just as a matter of uh, sort of democratic culture. We do it occasionally, we do it in Knesset. It, it's always a point of great contention. We've undone, we have un done some of the legislation of the previous government uh, on draft laws, on, on, on economic issues. Um, I can tell you I did it very reluctantly, uh, but you know, he's a part of it. So, you know, I don't, I don't expect, frankly, any future administration to move swiftly to undo the Iran debate. You know, I think it's something we're going to have to live with and plan to live with for, for the coming year. Your last question? Ellis <laughs> Strom. Um, it's like an Israeli audience, it's great. Um, so I was in the 97th Battalion with Mm -hmm. and um, I had two questions, one's a bit personal and one's more political. Um, when I was trying to make Aliyah, um, there was a legal loophole that said because I was there from when I was 18, I had to serve a full three years, even though I had, You know we're dealing with this right now? Even though I, I, I was dealing with this, in, this with Knesset yesterday. Wow. You have to explain it, amazing. Because it's, it's a conundrum we face. There's a thing called mahal, where, where young Americans can come and serve in the Israeli army for a year. And then if they finish the year and they want to stay in Israel and make aliyah, the IDF will draft them for another two years. Because to not draft them is to be prejudicial against uh, Israeli soldiers, particularly Chaim Mubadim, long soldiers, who have come, made aliyah, and signed on for three years. And so it creates a situation in Hebrew known as Eifa, Eifa, okay? And how then do you square that round thing? So we're trying to find a compromise. One compromise I looked at in Knesset yesterday, because uh, I'm dealing with this in my committee, uh, is that they'll get you to sign on another year, that we'll compromise on one year rather than two years. Um, I don't know if that's going to be acceptable to a lot of people or not, but it, 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 it's the best we're going to be able to do, it seems like. Okay. And my other question was, what does Israel plan to do about EU infringing on our sovereignty and you've done so wrong? Okay, okay. So that was a committee meeting I went to yesterday also. You <laughs> 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 like fair. <laughs> Swiftly and uh, decisively to remove those buildings. 
And I don't care what the Europeans say. What are they going to do? They're going to mark our products? They're going to boycott us? <laughs> uh, no. And um, I said this as a centrist. I'm a centrist in the government. I believe that, that that's a bad. This is this is. They are violating their own commitments. The Europeans are not signatories to the Oslo Accords, which created areas A, B, and C. That's 1993. But they are signatories to the 2002 Roadmap as part of the quartet. And the 2002 Roadmap is predicated on the Oslo Accords. So the Europeans are violating their international commitments. I say, take those buildings down right now. Don't let them get away with that. Uh, <laughs> Compare at all. This isn't the first time where we've had such a major no. divide. You look at you know Begin and Carter. There was that um, major divide, and that ended up in a major peace treaty with Egypt, our arch uh, enemy at that time, um, wanting to potentially destroy the state of Israel. Um, do you see any light at the end of that tunnel? As was, you know, by comparing that to um, you know 30, 40 years ago. Um, you know, just as, as a matter of historical record, Ben-Gurion had a notoriously bad uh, uh, relationship with Eisenhower. He did not have a good relationship with Kennedy. Kennedy, you know, the first Israeli prime minister to visit the White House took place during the Johnson administration, let me ask you. David Ben-Gurion was never in the White House. Um, so, you know, I can think, think quite many examples of, of strained relationships. Um, but uh, no, I don't think that, uh, since there's no Sadat out there, and keep in mind that, that Sadat is also a matter of historical record, Sadat came to Jerusalem not because the President of the United States prodded him. He came to Jerusalem because he was afraid of what the President was doing and reinviting the Soviets back into the Middle East. And that's how the Camp David process was born. And that's, I'm not saying anything controversial, that is a matter of record. Uh, Carter wanted it to, to convene an international peace conference. Sadat had, had risked his life to get rid of the Soviets, and the president was bringing them back in. Um, so, since there's no Sadat out there right now, I, I, I don't think a situation where um, you know, that this particular relationship is somehow going to heal around a, a breakthrough in the peace process. It's not going to happen. Abu Mazen is not, is not on our Sadat. He's not King Hussein Jordan. And so I don't think that, there, that that's going to be I don't. And this, was, this was the uplifting question. Yes. <laughs> this was the inspiring question. Go ahead. Try again. Okay. Uh, my question is, how do we stay informed and stay in touch today? Because in America, we are all very sort of confused a lot of what's going on in the media. And although we have so many I'm talking to a guy who seven newspapers before I ever work with him. <laughs> and I'm viewing news all day long. Uh, listen, there are uh, newsletters that come out. I, 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 I'm a particular fan of the Times of Israel. I think it's an excellent uh, website. Uh, Daily Word is an excellent uh, uh, website. These are the things that I'm, I'm looking at all the time. And you could also recall the Kahal and the Sabra Report. <laughs>
product of our own machine map, which we're very interested in. And based on your, you know, what I'm doing. So again, I began walking.